curious about how encryption actually works? Well, in this video, we're gonna find out. In this video, we're gonna explore encryption. And really from the ground up, what are the types of encryption, how they're used, and how it relates to when we access things like Azure over the internet. Now, there's really two key types of encryption, symmetric and asymmetric. And we're probably all used to symmetric encryption. As kids, we probably used it. We may have had a best friend and we would write secret notes and we'd be really clever we'd encrypt the note by shifting the alphabet a few letters. And this is known as kind of the shift cipher or Caesar because Caesar used it. And you could think about this, and this is actually a Caesar key, a coin. And you can pick the number of letters I wanna offset by. So my cipher would be the shift cipher. And the key is the number of letters I'm going to shift by. So I'm just going to set it to three. And then from the inside ring to the outer, I look at the letter and then what that shift is. So I could think about if I wanted to send a message of hi, well, my key is three. I'm shifting by three. So I would look at this and I'll go, okay, well, H is K. And then I is L. And then the other person, well, they know the key is three. So they look from the outside in. So, okay, K, okay, well, K is H. And L is I. So they've decrypted it. You both knew the key. So the same key is used for both the encryption and the decryption. And you'd probably be pretty disappointed if that was the note, you could have just said that, probably didn't need protecting. But that's an example of symmetric encryption. The same key both encrypts and decrypts. It locks and unlocks. Now, a challenge with this is sharing that key. How do I share that three in this case? And maybe, hey, on the way to school, maybe say, hey, let's have a shift of four or three today. But if we think about computer terms, that shared key, that's an important part. How do I share that securely? And I can think about another analogy of this is just like, hey, look, key to a house. I use the same key to unlock the door and lock the door. So the same key both locks and unlocks. So in computer terms, we can absolutely think about, yes, we have some message, and then we have some key that's used to create this encrypted version of the message. And then I have the same key can then be used to get the message back. And things like AES and 3DES are examples of ciphers that use symmetric. And it's very efficient. So I can do this pretty quickly. My key length might be 128 bits, 256 bits, it varies. But the point is I have this key. It's very efficient for large amounts of data to be encrypted and decrypted. But the challenge is sharing that key. How do I securely share the key? Because if I don't securely share the key, then if someone else gets that, they can read my traffic. They can even maybe put their own traffic in the middle. So that's a, a really bad day. So let me think about asymmetric. And the idea about asymmetric is essentially we have two keys. I can think about, I have my key one, then it has a partner, key two. And one of them is private, one of them is public. Because the idea here is, well, hey, look, I have my message. And if I encrypt it, so there's still some cipher is used for this. If I encrypt it with one of the keys, so now I've got this kind of 
encrypted message, whatever, only the other key can actually decrypt to get the message back. I cannot decrypt it with the same key that encrypted it and vice versa. If I used this key to encrypt it, then I have to use the other key to decrypt it. So this is asymmetric. So let's, let's think about another analogy of this. Remember my house key example, it's symmetric. The same key both locks and unlocks. And maybe I have kind of a lock box somewhere that I want to share with someone. And I want to kind of share the key. But if I just send the key over a regular post, well, anyone could intercept that. There, there's challenges with that. Because I send the key in the post, well, someone could have intercepted this key, replaced it with their own. And now they're gonna be kind of a man in the middle. So an asymmetric equivalent could kind of be a padlock. With this padlock, anyone could lock it, but only I can unlock it with the key. So if I wanted someone to send me something privately, what I could actually do is send them a padlock. So in the post, I send them the padlock and they get the padlock. Now they need to make sure it really came from me. So maybe what it is, it's got like a serial number on it and they can go to the padlock company who they trust, they're very reputable, and it's got a serial number on it and they can check and they can see, yes, that was actually sold to John Savile. And we trust that that company checked my driver's license, whatever, to make sure it really was me that bought this padlock. So now they have a lock box, they lock it with the padlock. So anyone could lock with this padlock. And then they send the box to me. Now it's locked, only I have the key, this private key. So when it comes, I'm the only person that can unlock it. So that's kind of half of that idea that, hey, I've got this key and only the other one can unlock it. So that's a way that someone could send me something and I know that I'm the only one that can actually get what's inside. This, anyone I can send this over the post, it doesn't really matter and then they lock it, only I can unlock and get the data out. And that's kind of how we start to evolve this idea of the symmetric. We have these two keys, and what we have is one of them is this private key, and one of them is public. So now I don't have the key exchange problem. Everyone can know my public key, it, it doesn't matter only I have my private key. Now I still have a trust issue. How do I know that, hey, I'm giving a certificate and a certificate is how we generally will share the public key. How do I know that's really my certificate? So what we have is we have these kind of certificate authorities and we talk about a trust chain. So there are certificate authorities at the top that are highly reputable. If you look in your operating system, and I'll show you this later on in the demo, there are some that are built in and trusted. Well, they can, either kind of sign other certificate authorities, an intermediary, or they can issue certificates themselves. Now they won't, often these top level won't issue certificates to you and I. They're gonna have some intermediary CA who then creates us a cert. So there's a trust chain that we can view. And so as long as this certificate, we trust it, we know, hey, that, that's good, we can use it. So now we have the idea that I have a private key and anyone can know my public key. And I can use this in a number of different ways. If I want to send a message to you, and I want to prove it really was me that sent it, and that no one's altered it in between, if I have my message, what I can do is I can create a digest, like a hash of the content of the message. So I kind of get this hash that I work out based on the content. Then I'm going to use my private key to generate a signature. So the signature is the, the digest, the hash based on the content of the message. And then I run it through a, an algorithm using my private key and I attach it to the message. I can then send that over 
So you receive the message with my signature on it. And then what you do is, well, hey, you run it through the same algorithm to get the hash. And now everyone knows my public key. So the public key can decrypt that signature. So using the public key, it's gonna spit out a hash value. And if they match, I know it's not been messed with, the content of the message hasn't been messed with, or this hash would change that I generated. And because the hash value that I can decrypt from the signature is the same, well, I know it really came from the sender because it's the right signature. The value matches, only I have the private key, only I could create that signature. So if I wanna send something to someone and guarantee it's really from me and it's not changed, I can use my private key to sign it. Now that solves the problem of it really came from me, but anyone can still read the message. I'm just proving it came from me. I'm proving my authentication is really me. What about if I want to send an encrypted message to them? Well, encrypting the message with my private key is useless because everyone has my public key. So what we do is, let's say here, I'm a user and maybe there's a server over here, there's some service and I want to maybe send it some private data well, this has a private public key. This service I'm accessing, let's say I'm accessing it using HTTPS. This means it's encrypted with TLS and it has a certificate. Then that certificate is its public key. So over here it has this cert and it has its public key in it. So that's the public key. So what I can do is if I want to send it a message, I've got my message here. I'm gonna encrypt it with their public key. So I'm gonna take the public key and that's gonna spit out this payload. Let's do payload. I can then send that to the service. What can decrypt it? Only the private key only this has the private key. So now it has that corresponding private key. It's got it buried away very safely. There's his private key. So he gets this message. He takes that message, opens it with the private key, and sure enough, we'll now have the message. So if I wanna send something securely to someone, I don't encrypt it with my private key because everyone could decrypt it. My public key is public. If I wanna send something to someone privately, I use their public key because only they have the private key, only they can decrypt it. Okay, so we have asymmetric, very efficient, great for large amounts of data, but I have this challenge because it's the same key to encrypt and decrypt. How do I share that key? Then we have the asymmetric encryption. We have a private public key pair. So this solves the distribution of the key. This is actually fairly expensive in terms of computation. Um, the key length might be 2048 bits. So it's a much bigger key to get the same level of encryption and it's expensive. It's really not ideal in terms of sending large amounts of data. So we actually like to use a combination of these. So let's go back and let's think again that hey i'm a user over here so i'm going to be a computer this time and once again there's this service in azure let's say it's azure this time and yes i want to establish my end goal is to send things over https uh, a tls encrypted it used to be ssl uh, TLS has kind of replaced that, transport layer security. Now there's a few things that happen. When I first talk to someone, the first thing that actually happens 
is we have to establish a, a TCP session. So we have that TCP session established first. There's kind of a handshake goes on there. Once we establish the TCP session, then we're gonna go ahead and establish a TLS session. Now as part of this, we're actually going to agree a cipher suite. What do we both understand? What do we both use? Now, to do this, this service I've connected to, I'm gonna use its public key. So I want to share something privately. What I'm actually going to do, there's a few things that bounce agree. It's like, hey, hello, hey, hello back. So there, there's a few sort of, there's a kind of hello going on over here. And then we kind of agree the cipher we're going to use. And we need to agree like a master key that's gonna be used to generate a symmetric key to actually use for encryption. But to do this, this service, it has that certificate where I have that public key. So what I'm gonna do is when I'm generating that master key that's gonna be used to actually generate this, the symmetric key, I'm gonna generate a key it's going to be kind of this, it forms the symmetric key. And I'm going to encrypt that using their public key. I can then send that over as I'm establishing sort of this TLS traffic. They can then, because it's encrypted with the public key, extract that out and then run it through kind of the same algorithm to now generate a symmetric key we both have. So that's the key point. We've solved the problem of sharing that symmetric key because I sent the symmetric key using their public key. So we're combining. So when we talk about, well, what does TLS use? Is it symmetric or asymmetric? Well, it's asymmetric first. I'm using their public key to send them. This master key part will be used to create the symmetric key. And now once they both have this symmetric key, my encrypted session is using that shared key because the symmetric is more efficient. And that's what I want to use for large amounts of data. So that's how we then actually go ahead and send things over the internet. So when I go to my HTTPS service, what's actually happening is we establish a TCP session. We then Hey, there's a TLS established. We agree what ciphers, what key length, what do we both support? Using their public key, so I'm using asymmetric, I'm gonna send a master key, which we then use to create that symmetric key. And then we just send the traffic encrypted using symmetric, the same key to both encrypt and decrypt. So hopefully that kind of helps understand how we use the encryption, how we have the asymmetric and the symmetric. And a key point, when I'm sending things over HTTPS, um, like with storage, there's a shared access signature. If I wanna access a certain blob, for example, in a storage account, rather than just make it public, I can use a shared access signature. I have to know this signature as part of the URL to actually access the data. So if I actually looked at it, I would see like it's, it's HTTPS, and then it's gonna be blob Azure, the file I want, then there's a bunch of stuff. There's a time, but the big thing is there's kind of a signature. There's this big, long value. And people will say, well, that's useless. You're sending that over the internet in plain text. So everyone can see the signature. So anyone could grab that and then use it themselves. And that's not true. Because the point is, this is part of the request we're going to make. Everything after kind of the name is the request. That's not just sent plain text. What happens is, even before all of this, there's a DNS lookup. I have to find, hey, what is blob Azure storage? So I get an IP address. That's the only bit that's really public, that DNS lookup. I then establish the TCP session to that target. I then establish the TLS session to that target. And then over this encrypted session, I make the request. And that's when I send the file I want and the signature. 
So that file, that signature in the shared access signature, it's not sent plain text over the internet, even though it's part of the URL. It's sent in the encrypted part. Just because it looks like, hey, one long string, doesn't mean that's how it's actually used. I establish this secure encrypted session, and then I send the request over that encrypted session. So this is never sent plain text. So even though that signature is at the end of a URL, it doesn't send that plain text and then establish the security. This is DNS lookup. I establish uh, TCP to the target. I establish TLS to the target, get that shared key. And then over that encrypted session, then I make the request. So I hope that kind of helped drive home some of that encryption. Let's take a really quick look at exactly this. I'm going to take a shared access signature uh, for a picture and then quickly look at the IP trace and we'll see, hey, yeah, there's the DNS lookup. There's the TCP handshake. There's the TLS. And then over that encryption, which I can't see in the capture, but as part of that, I'll see, hey, this is where that request and the data would be sent back. So here you can see I've got set up the Microsoft Message Analyzer. And I've got it running and I'm just filtering. So I'm trying to block out the RDP traffic and I only want to see my own machine. I'm using Internet Explorer and I'm going to paste in a shared access signature. Now you can see the host is Blob for my storage account. I'm using HTTPS. Then all the way at the end of the URL, I can see the signature. And that's the important part, knowing that is what's going to give me the access. So I pasted that and there's the end result, picture of my dog. Then there's all this traffic. So if I stop that, we want to kind of look through everything it captured. So as we go through, there's obviously other data. There's a DNS lookup. Uh, that's not the one I'm looking for. That's for API Bing. I'm looking for one for the storage account. So we go through. And there it is. So there's a DNS lookup. And notice all it's requested is the host name. It's not the full URL. It's just asking for the host name. And then I'm going to get a response back with an answer. And here I can actually see, yep, here we go. It's kind of an alias to the blob. And there's the IP address. Now, I also did an IP lookup earlier using NSLOOKUP. And we can see that result matches. So that's what I actually need to talk to. Then I flush the DNS. So when I enter it in Internet Explorer, we'll actually see that DNS lookup. And now we actually see that establishment of the TCP. So we see a conversation starting for TCP. Again, there's no payload. There's no URL. It's not sending any of that yet. So I'm going to establish my TCP session. So it's going back and forth with that blob account. But still, no payload, no URL. Can't see that signature anywhere. So this is kind of this handshake that's happening. And that's going to have a few packets kind of bouncing back and forth. And then we start the TLS. Now here we can see the client hello. So we're going to start that handshake. Then what we're going to get back and what we care about is that server hello. So that's the response back. And now it's going to give me a certificate. Now remember, that certificate has its public key. So that's going to enable me now to actually send it something securely because only it has the private key. So only it can actually read the data back. So this is asymmetric encryption. But it's giving me that public certificate. We're going to agree now on kind of the ciphers. So, hey, what do you support? What do I support? We're going to change the cipher spec. We're going to exchange parts of the key. And you can see kind of those various records as we kind of go through and agree on, well, what versions we're going to use, what key length, etc. And they're all kind of more details that I'm not going to go into on this video. But essentially, we're going to end up with we have exchanged this key. So now we've exchanged this key, we can actually start an encrypted conversation. Now, because it's Azure, there is a little bit more moving parts. It obviously has a whole set of edge infrastructure. But now this is the application data. 
and this is all encrypted. This is where I send the request. I can't see it. I cannot see the URL. I cannot see that signature. It's all encrypted in that application payload and that's kind of that key part. I cannot actually see what that data is. I've created that TLS session and I'm really good to go. But again, because it's Azure, there are different moving parts. There's a whole edge environment. But now let's go back to that browser for a second. And I want to see this padlock. And it's showing me, hey, this is the certificate authority that has identified the site. And I can view the certificate. So it's a wild card. It's a star.blob.core.windows.net. I can see who it was issued by, Microsoft IT. I can look at the cert path because that trust chain is important. That's what lets me know, well, that public key, I can really use it. It really is from who it says it's from. And what I can do is on my local machine here, I can look at all the local trusted certificate authorities. So for the computer account, I can go and look at, well, hey, my trusted root certificate authorities. And there's all the ones that built in. And I'm looking for this DigiCert Baltimore route. If I look at the details, I can see where well, it's actually this Baltimore CyberTrust route. And it's also going to have a thumbprint. So now if I look at my actual local ones on my machine, and again, I'm looking for this Baltimore CyberTrust route. Well, there it is. If I look at the details, if I look at my thumbprint, does it match the thumbprint of the root of the certificate trust chain? Yes, it does. And because I trust that, I trust it did its job. It did its job giving the cert to the Microsoft IT, and they did their job giving this wildcast, so I trust the cert. So that's kind of the important part of the asymmetric with the private public key. I have to trust the public key, and that's how we do it. It's through that trust chain. So I hope that was useful. Um, if this was, please give it a like and subscribe. Till next time, take care.